So in this lecture, we're going to continue our discussion of fixed points by looking at two questions the mathematicians have a tendency to obsess over. First is a uh, question of existence. Under what circumstances can we be certain that a fixed point exists at all? And second is uniqueness. Uh, under, again, under what other circumstances uh, can we be sure that not only do we have a fixed point, but that that fixed point is unique? So I have our, our existence theorem here, and I know it, it gets a little wordy, and there's a lot of talk about this interval, this closed interval from A to B, and I think that part makes it a, a little tricky to understand because there's actually two intervals we're talking about here. All right, so let, let's see if we can just break this, break this down one piece at a time. First, we're assuming that the function that we're trying to find a fixed point for is continuous on the interval from A to B. Okay, let's sketch that in here. Right, so this is x equals a, and this is x equals b. So we're only going to be concerned about our, our function between those two values. And g of x is contained in the interval from a to b for all x in the interval a to b. And this is the part where I think it gets just a little weird. This interval from a to b is on the y-axis, where this one is on the x-axis. So in other words, it's saying that as long as we stay between these two x values, then the y values stay between these two bounds. Right? In other words, we're only looking at the function kind of inside this box. All right? And as long as our function stays in here, then I can be certain it has at least one fixed point. And to kind of intuitively see what's going on here, remember that a function has a fixed point if there exists a point where the graph of the function crosses the graph of the line y equals x. Right, so let me add that into the diagram. Now I think you maybe start to see what's happening here. It isn't a coincidence that this is the di that this line is a diagonal. Right, this point down here is a comma a, and this point up here is b comma b. So yes. That line y equals x is going to be a diagonal of this box that we've created. And now I think you can kind of start to see what's happening. If we start over here uh, on the left side, somewhere on this line x equals a, and the function is going to go all the way over to the other side, there is no way to get over to that line x equals b without at some point crossing that diagonal, and that point is going to be our fixed point. Okay, so let's see if we can prove this. I've got the same setup over here, the same diagram. So this is x equals a, and this is x equals b. All right, so first, if g of a is equal to a, or g of b is equal to b, then we're done. Right, then one of those is, one or both of those, uh, are fixed points, and the fixed point therefore exists. Okay, so assume they aren't. Let's, let's look at the case where they aren't. Assume g of a is not equal to a, and g of b is not equal to b. Then this tells us two things. First, g of a is greater than a, because a is, that, is the lower bound and g of b is less than b, again, because b is the upper bound. All right, so I'm going to define a new function then. I'm going to say let, uh, I'm already use g right here. Let's say let h of x equal g of x minus x. So the first thing I want you to notice here is uh, that h is continuous, right, because it's the difference of two continuous functions. Okay, I also want you to notice that h of a is equal to g of a minus a, but because g of a is bigger than a, that's greater than zero. Also, h of b is equal to g of b minus b, and this time it's the other way around. g of b is smaller than b, so this is less than zero. All right. So I have this function h, and on one end of this interval, it's below zero, and on the other end of the interval, 
it's greater than zero. Well, according to the intermediate value theorem, and this is the exact same argument we used back when we're talking about uh, the midpoint method, the bisection method. Because it's less than zero at one end and greater than zero on the other end, there must be there must be a point P on this interval from A to B such that H of P equals zero. But h of p is g of p minus p. Move the p over to the other side. There must exist a point such that g of p is equal to p, and that's a fixed point. Right? There's the fixed point that we were looking for. Okay, now that we know when we can expect a fixed point to exist, when can we expect a fixed point to be unique? And that's going to be kind of an important question from our numerical analysis perspective, think about our fixed point iteration method for finding the, the solution to an equation, right? Because I, I'd like to know that there's only one possible answer in this interval. Okay, so I've, I've got this uniqueness theorem here, and the if part is practically identical to what we had in the previous theorem. The only part that I'm adding is the part that I've got here in bold. Okay, so everything in here, that's just uh, not quite that far. Everything in here is just setting up that same box that we were talking about uh, in the existence theorem. The new part here is that I'm also going to require that the derivative has to be less than 1 for every point on the interval. Okay, so how does that show uniqueness? Well, well let's, let's do this. Assume... There are two fixed points, P and Q, obviously on this interval, such that P is not equal to Q. Rather, we're we're going to do this by contradiction. Right? So I'm going, to, I'm going to assume that there are, in fact, two fixed points and show that this causes a problem. Okay, well, let, let's say... This is x equals p, and this is x equals q. Right? Well, the coordinates of the corresponding points of the graph, remember it's a fixed point, right? So this, this is going to be the point p comma f of p, and this is going to be the point q comma f of q. And they do have to be on that diagonal. Remember, because they're fixed points, f of q is equal to q. So this is actually the point Q comma Q, and F of P is equal to P. So this is the point P comma P. All right, so what, what is then, what's the slope of the secant line to my curve through those points? Well, the slope of the secant line is going to be P minus Q over P minus Q, which is 1. Okay, so now I've got my graph. I don't know exactly what it's doing, but it's going around here somewhere between those two points. Now, because my function is continuous, remember the mean value theorem from back in the first semester calculus. The mean value theorem says that there must be a point on this interval somewhere where the slope of the tangent line at that point is equal to the slope of the secant line. That's the mean value theorem. All right, so let's say... Uh, that point is R. Right, so remember what, what the mean value theorem says is that F prime of R is equal to the slope of the secant line. But the slope of the secant line, that's 1. So the theorem says F prime of R is equal to 1, but that's our contradiction. right? Because remember, back up here, we assumed, we required, that the derivative has to be strictly less than 1. Right, so because the existence of two fixed points, two distinct fixed points, uh, would cause a contradiction that is actually false. So we can say, therefore, P is equal to Q, and there is, therefore, only one fixed point on the interval 
a comma b. So the key things I want you to take away from this uh, are these first two points here. The, the, this is the requirement that g is continuous on the interval from a to b, and f of x is contained in the interval from a to b. This is what I call the box criterion. It puts a box around our function. Uh, and second, this is the idea that we're interested in functions that are differentiable and have the absolute value of the derivative less than one on that open interval. All right? This, these are some very these are some key criteria that we're going to see turn up over and over again throughout the rest of our discussion uh, of not just fixed point iteration but iterative methods in general. Okay, so in the next lecture, uh, we're, we're going to take the next step. We're going to cycle back to that idea of our fixed point iteration method, and we're going to look at the circumstances where it converges and get uh, a bound on the error of the sequence that we get from doing that iterative method.